What it means to be saved. I think we, we typically, we have a general understanding of it. But I think sometimes we, uh, I think sometimes people, they still try and fit, well, I'm good enough to, to be saved. I'm a good person. Uh, maybe I do stuff for the church. Maybe I even go to church. But does that equate to, to salvation? What, what does salvation look like? And, you know, it's, it's something that I've heard more and more, um, you know, talking with other pastors, uh, talking with other people who are in, um, in, in places of leadership, that they're encountering people who have been going to churches for decades and, and going, you know, very fervently. And saying that they've never heard an invitation to accept Jesus. What in the world were these people doing? How is it that somebody can go to church for that long and not know if they're saved? So, this week's message actually was spawned out of Bible study this week. Um, those of you that's, that's been coming to Bible study, and, and for those that have, have seen it announced and heard me talk about it, we've started a Bible study um, that coincides with uh, the series, The Chosen. And in, in this past week's episode... Uh, it was showing and sharing uh, parts of uh, two of the characters that we've met thus far, which is Mary Magdalene and Nicodemus. And so those are, those are two people that we don't hear from very often uh, in the Bible. They're, they're, what we see of them is fairly brief in terms of you know, how, how much they're mentioned in the Bible, but they're there. And they both play very important parts in the Bible, in the brief times that they're mentioned. And there was an interaction. Uh, in one episode, the first episode, uh, Jesus meets Mary and heals her. And He tells her, you know what? He says, hey, you are mine, you are redeemed. And He heals her. Alright, and so the next episode, uh, there was a brief interaction with Nicodemus and Mary Magdalene. And so they, they meet and they talk. And there's this interaction because Nicodemus is trying to figure out what had happened. And so they're having this beautiful exchange. And you can tell that Mary, she's trying to understand it herself. She just knows that there's something different. And they're just having this beautiful conversation. And we're going to come back to that. There's one statement in there that has been just hanging with me all week. And I feel like this, that, was the, that was the sign from God that said, here you go, preach on this this week. And so I'm going to come back to that statement. Because when I get to it, I typed it up and I want you to write it down. But before we get to that, what I want you to do... Let's turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Now, as far as Mary Magdalene goes, we don't have any record of her early in the Gospels, with the, except for here in Luke. This is the earliest we get any mention of Mary Magdalene. Uh, or a, a more proper term would be Mary of Magdala, because that's where she was from. And the, the, the gospel writers put that name in there, that designation, because Mary was a very, very popular name in the first century. And so this was a designation to separate her from the other Marys that would show up in the Gospels. And so Mary of Magdala. We meet her probably for the first time here in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. And it's very brief. And it doesn't seem like there's very much to it. 
But let's read this. If everyone would, let's stand for the Word of God. It said, Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word this morning. Lord, we just pray that you would come through loud and clear this morning. Lord, that is always, I would move out of the way, Lord, and just let you, let you flow this morning through me. And allow your message to be heard, not mine. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, in, in listening to, to this and, and this mention that we have here, there's a question. Some of us have probably asked this question. How do I know that I'm saved? Have you ever asked yourself that question? You know, doubt will creep in to the best of us. And so we ask this question, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, I'm happy to tell you the Bible's full of answers that tell us what takes place. And today I listed a few of these. But this question comes up, how do I know that I'm saved? That's a, that's a very important person. If you go to church and you're serious about your relationship with Jesus, then this is a question you've asked. Because, I mean, you know, when we, we start talking about heaven and hell, I, I don't know about you, but heaven sounds a lot more pleasant than hell, right? So, you know, uh, you know the Bible tells us that, you know, Jesus is the way. And uh, we can't get there without Him. So, you know what? I want to know. I want to know the answer to this. How do I know that I'm saved? And for you young folks, you need to listen and pay attention. Because this is a very important question that you need to answer. How do I know that I'm saved? Your parents can't save you. Your grandparents. Nobody in this church can save you. Only Jesus can save you. And that's between you and Him. There's a conscious decision that takes place. So you need to understand the answer to this. And there is an answer. There in verse 1 it says, Soon afterward, and this is talking about Jesus. Jesus was traveling and He was ministering to different towns and villages. So, so afterward He went on through these seasoned and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with Him. So this account takes place very early in Jesus' public ministry. Alright, so He's already chosen the twelve. But look what comes next. And he said, also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. And the first one mentioned is married called Magdalene. This is very early. So we know that Jesus had healed Mary very early on in his public ministry. And so not only did the twelve disciples, not only were they following Jesus, but there was a group of uh, dedicated women who were also following along. And the very first one mentioned is Mary Magdalene. Now this one, it says that this one he had healed, seven demons had gone out. Now he had healed other people with demon possession. But we don't know how many other demons may have been, had presided in these others that he healed. But we know that there were seven here. Now can you imagine the torment? You know, there's one account where it's talking about a, a, a boy that was demon possessed, or a man that was demon possessed, and he kept throwing himself into the fire trying to hurt himself. Remember, Jesus healed that person. Now here's seven. Can you imagine the torment that was going on with Mary? Now we don't know anything else about Mary. Now I know there's been a lot of superstitions, a lot of different things about you know, how she was in life. And we don't know those things. It's all uh, suspect. And it's all up to interpretation. But one thing we do know, she did come from a pretty rough place. Magdala, where she was from, was a notoriously bad city. And so, you know, we don't know what she was involved with. We don't know where she was at in society. But one thing we do know, she may have been, she may have had uh, some sufficient means about her. 
which we find out here in this next, because we read this list, not only was Mary, but these other ones there, it said who provided for them, and, and in some manuscripts it says uh, them there, it says him. So they were providing for him. They were helping take care of Jesus in his ministry as well. They were taking care of their pastor. And so they were going around. So they had means of their own, which they were using to help the ministry. But they were following Jesus. They were dedicated to Jesus. And then, we don't really see or hear from Mary Magdalene again until we get to the end of the Gospels. So we don't know anything else about her life until we get to the very end. Now, I want to come back to Mary because I think we see very little of her, but the little bit that we see, I think, answers the question. But I'm going to give you some other scripture to back up what I'm going to tell you. Is that all right? Turn with me to Romans 12, 2. Now, this is, this is actually, I've preached out of this before. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, but I just want to touch on it briefly because it does answer the question. How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know? Romans 12, 2. I'll let you get there. Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world or to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Alright, so there's two words there that, that make this um, pretty easy to understand. The first one is the word transformed. In the Greek, I, think, I believe it's pronounced metamorphosi. That's where we get our English word, metamorphosis. Now, you all, everybody that's went through school, you know what this word means because they explained it to you in probably earth science or something earlier. This is what happens when a, 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 a little caterpillar makes a cocoon and out comes a butterfly. It's a, it is a completely different creature. It is not the same. Everything about this creature is different. So this is where we get the word from. So you understand what transformed me. You understand what metamorphosis means. It means you are not the same. So when you ask the question, how do I know that I'm saved? It, there has to be a transformation. There has to be a metamorphosis that takes place in your life. You are no longer the same. Now, can you understand that? That's pretty, that's pretty concrete, right? It's not hard to understand. He also says by the renewal of your mind. And, and what that means is that you've got you to gotta change your way of thinking because before you were thinking things a little bit differently. Maybe you were thinking through the world or your own standards. But now, now that you've been changed, you've got to renew your mind to start thinking about the things of God. Now, if you ask yourself, am I thinking about the things of God on a daily basis? Am I changed? Am I truly changed? Ask yourself the question, am I truly saved? How do I know that I'm saved? Just ask yourself, have I changed my life at all? Do I do anything different than I used to do? That's a pretty simple question too, isn't it? It one that should be easily answered because you know whether or not you're thinking through the lens of God's perspective because it comes right here in His Word. His Word tells you what His will and way is, what His perspective is, and what He expects of you. And if you're not living according to this, then you need to ask yourself that question again. How do I know that I'm saved? And you need to go to this verse right here and say, you know what? Am I completely changed? Am I a different person than I was before? Have I renewed my mind to quit thinking about the world and thinking through it that way and start thinking it through the lens of Jesus Christ and what He tells me to do? Are you there? Are you living that way? So how do I know that I'm saved? Okay, 
Let's go to another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now, if you know anything about Corinthians, you know that Paul was dealing with some people who were struggling about their salvation issues and about their spiritual gifts. And Paul was trying to set them straight about how to understand, you know, this, this new life that they were trying to live. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. See, there we go again. There we go with that whole pesky thing again. Well, I've got to be new. I've got to be changed. I can't be like I was. If anyone is in Christ, I mean, if anybody speaks out of their mouth and says, yeah, I know Jesus. He's my Savior then you better be a new creation. Because if you're not, you're lying. I don't know a simpler way of saying it. He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So you're not living like the old you. You're living like the new you. Now, this doesn't mean that you're not going to stumble along the way. We've all stumbled along the way trying to find this new path. But the difference is you're trying really hard not to live like your old self through Jesus Christ. You're looking at His Word and saying, How can I change? How can I be more like you? How can I be, how can I be seen more like your image? Those are the questions you start to ask on a daily basis. And everything that you do, you start looking at it that way. You don't, you don't think about it your old way. When you start thinking about, well, what would Kevin do in this situation? No, I better start asking, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? Because that's when it really starts... That's when you really start to see that there's change taking place because you're consciously thinking about that change that should have taken place in your life. You know, people don't like hearing these words. It ain't mine, it's right there. If you don't like it, argue with Jesus. He's the one that said it. He's the one that gave this to Paul. Not me. If you are not living different, then I don't know if you are saved. I don't know your heart. But I should, there should be something different. You should not be acting like your old self. I'm sorry. That's not me. That's, that's God's Word. Take it up with Him. If you're still not convinced, let's, let's go to John 3.3, 3, okay? Let's go to John 3.3. 3. I think most people know this one. John 3.3. 3. This is where Jesus is having a little chit-chat with Nicodemus. And I think this is, this is, Jesus, uh, this is Nicodemus' come to Jesus moment if you will. Now Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He had asked to meet Jesus. And he'd done it in the cover of night because he was concerned about some optics there. But Jesus didn't shy away from telling Nicodemus the truth and what was, what was really going on and what mattered. And, and Nicodemus, he, he at least was exploring and at least asking the right questions because I feel like he really wanted to understand. And he even expressed, he said, look, I've seen the things you're doing. He said, nobody can do this stuff unless they're from God. And then Jesus makes this statement. He said, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And, and, and this is explained in the same way that we've already read in the other two passages of Scripture. There's a change. There, you have to be born again in the Spirit. 
You're not going to live like the old person. You're going to start trying to live like the new person. And at the end of Jesus' life, hanging on the cross, we see Nicodemus. He shows up there. I think he got it. I think he understood what Jesus was talking about. The other thing here that, that struck me when we look at the stuff that John the Baptist was saying, that the kingdom was at hand, and then we see, we see follow-up with when Jesus, he came and was preaching, he said the kingdom is here. I started thinking, you know, I used to think in this terms of heavenly terms, and it, and it still is, but think about this, for those, for those you know, people who, who say, you know, who are not saved and who keep trying to put on a show or whatever, I think this applies to here on earth. They can't see the kingdom of God taking place right here on earth. I think this is a twofold meaning. If you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Because, you know, let's take all the things that are going on in the world right now. We see all the things that are taking place coming out of churches that we know are evil. Do you think they're looking at the kingdom? Not by doing what they're doing, they're not. Not by supporting the stuff they're supporting. Uh-uh. You can say it to you blue in the face. You can say, yeah, I'm saved. I know Jesus, blah, blah, blah. If there's not a change in you, I'm sorry. Something's amiss there. Again, I go back to the scriptures. If you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot get to the kingdom of God. Because later on in John, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father except through me. So if you want to get to the kingdom, you've got to go through Jesus. You can't just talk about it. You can't just say it. You've got to do something about it. And for the people who got this and understood it, you see it in their life because they made change. It was a conscious change. And as they dived into the Word of God and they followed Jesus more closely, guess what? It became like breathing. It became more natural to them. Kingdom action was more natural. As Christians, as we grow, it should become more natural. That's something else the Bible says, but we won't get into that here today. But in case you're still not convinced, let's go to Ephesians. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Amen. Let's get excited reading about all this stuff. Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 22. Here, to put this into context, Paul was explaining the new life. When you get saved, he's saying, he's explaining, there's a new life. There's something new that takes place in your life. He said in verse 22, he says, You have to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Because before you accept Jesus in your life, you've accepted, you've accepted sin as your master. But once you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior... Those deceitful desires have to be left behind. He said, your old self, your old life, that's, that's back there with your old corrupt ways, your sinful lifestyle, all those things. And he says, and to be renewed, in verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So that's very reminiscent of what he said in Romans 12 too. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to start thinking about godly things. When you go to James, James has a nice little paragraph there in, in chapter 1 of James that talks about all good things come from God. All good things come from above. Your thoughts. You start thinking about God. 
But you have to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And then in verse 24, and he said, you have to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, how do you understand true righteousness and holiness? Right here. This is where you understand. This is, you understand what the image of God is like. Right here. In His Word. You put on the new self and you start trying to emulate what's in this book. The very words of God. That, that is what you try to do. Now, are we always going to get it right? No, we're not. But we are striving towards something. We are striving towards a, complete, a completeness. That we are changed. Something has happened in our life. We are changed. We have taken off the old self. And we have taken on the new. We have taken off that old outfit of deceitfulness. Uh, the, the, those, uh, the evil desires. The sinfulness in our life. We have taken all that off. And we have put on a robe of righteousness. And we're trying to live in the image that we have of Jesus here. He tells us and He shows us. And there's something different. There's a transformation that takes place. And we see that all through the Bible. The people who, who impacted and the people who were with Jesus and living with Jesus. We see that once He got a hold of them and they accepted Him, we see a change. There's something different that takes place. They are not the old people they once were. And so we have very clear examples of what it means to be saved. And so again, when you ask yourself, how do I know that I'm saved? I just gave you several good examples. And those are just a few. There's a lot more. So you, you realize there's a change. You can't act like the old self. You got to be like the new self. Now, let's get back to Mary. Now, we know very early on that Mary had an interaction with Jesus and he cast out seven demons. A woman who was tormented. That's all we know. We don't know anything else about her. But we know that she followed Jesus. And we know that there was a special connection. There was a special connection because when we see Mary show up again and she shows up in every one of the Gospels at the end, it is recorded for us that Mary Magdalene was there at the cross with other women. It says in one, in one, uh, one place, she was looking from afar. And then later on in John, it says that she was there at the cross looking at Jesus. So she didn't stay afar. She migrated up there with the other women. So she had a special connection to Jesus because Jesus had done something in her life. He had changed her. He had impacted her life. And where Jerusalem was was a long ways away from Magdala. So it wasn't just right down the road. It was a pretty good ways. And so she had traveled with these other people and followed along with Jesus and found herself there in Jerusalem when He was crucified, staring at her Savior, the one who had changed her life. There was dedication. There was commitment. And then not only that, she went to the tomb. She got up and went to the tomb. Found it empty. She went and told people. They came back and looked. And when they left, she went back. And she was weeping. And there were, two, there were some visitors there. She said, what are you doing? You know, one of our favorite Easter passages. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? That was Mary Magdalene that they were speaking to. And then not only that, who was the first person that Jesus talked to? Mary Magdalene. See, 
there was a very special commitment. And see, the thing I love is, see, he called her and said, Mary. And it was when he spoke her personal name that she realized who he was. Because of her expression, Rabboni, teacher. See, there, she dedicated her life from the moment that he changed her. Because there was a change. See, she didn't stay in Magdala. She didn't stay there, you know. He healed her. She could go on and, and live her normal life there in Magdala, but no, she chose to leave that and follow Jesus. And she was there in the important in the, the, the very important places here where we see her again with the other disciples, with the other women. Mary is mentioned more than any other woman there at the end. She was there at every special occasion where we see Jesus and her show up. So there was a special connection there. She loved Jesus. Because there was a change that took place. And, and I want to go back to that comment in our Bible study. Because it just... I don't know why when I'd watched it several times before, but this, this past week when we were talking about it and studying and, and, and we were going to go through the Bible study, it just hit me like a ton of bricks and I could not shake it. And it's the statement that I want you to write down. It's a simple statement. It's not in the Bible, but the meaning of it is very much true. And it was this. In the interaction between Nicodemus and her, he was questioning her about what had happened. And she said this, All I know is I was one way, and now I'm different. And the thing that happened in between was him. All through the Bible, we have several examples of people when they encountered Jesus, they were one way and then they were different. And the thing that was different, the thing that happened in between was Him. See, once you meet Him like that, once you accept Him like that, you cannot be the same. You can't. So there is a way to know that if you're saved, are you living like your old self? Or are you living like the new self? Are you striving in your old life? Or are you striving after your new life with Jesus? Are you going after the image of the world? Or are you going after the image of Jesus? This ain't rocket science. This is bare bones Christianity to know whether or not you are saved. You are different. You are changed. You have taken off the old self and put on the new and now you are living for Christ. And if you are truly living for Christ then you will follow just like Mary, just like the other disciples. You will dedicate your life to a life of service to the one that you serve. And if you're not doing that, then re-ask yourself the question, how, how do I know if I'm saved? Go revisit these scriptures and get on your knees. Talk to Jesus. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me of my sin. I, I, I repent. I want to know you today. Come into my life. Lead me. Get rid of this old creation, this old rag of a body. Give me the new one. Just like David said, get rid of this old heart. Give me that new one. Those are the things that you'll start asking for. Those are the things that you'll start looking for. And if you're doing that, then you're on the right path. But you will not live like your old self. Can I repeat that again? You will not live like your old self. You are a new creation. And you need to start acting like it. Let's all stand for a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, first of all, I got to say thank you for going to the cross for us. 
Because without that, we would not even have the opportunity to say, save me. We would not have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. That atoning sacrifice had to take place. And Father, we are so thankful and so grateful that you gave us that opportunity. And Lord, we're even more grateful or evenly grateful that you went to the cross. But not only that, you didn't stay there. You didn't stay in the tomb. You came out. And because of that, we're grateful because then we could live. We could die to self and live because of you. We have so much to be thankful for when we think about being saved. You have saved us. You have chosen us, Lord. You have, and it's not by anything that we've done. It's all by your goodness, your mercy, and your forgiveness. It's all based on those things of you, based on your holiness and righteousness. Nothing that we've done. And so, Lord, we thank You. And we praise You today for that. And Father, I do pray that if there's anybody here who hasn't, hasn't even remotely... Uh, a remote question about their salvation, Lord, I pray that they would ask these questions. Because You have answers. And You are there. You are there to fill that void in their heart, Lord, that, that's missing. Lord, they have to ask you. So Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here who has that question or has that doubt, Lord, I pray that they would invite you in, into their heart today and that they would accept your message and that they would accept your free gift of salvation and that they would die to self, get rid of the old creation and live in the new, in the image of and the holiness and the righteousness of the Father. Lord, I, I pray that on everyone who's here today. Lord, and I pray that we take this seriously. And by these things that we know, Lord, we can help others. Because there will be people who come to us and they will ask these questions. Lord, give us the inspiration, Lord, when we speak. That it will be your, your, your words and not ours, Lord, as we try to help those who may have doubts of their own. But Lord, in this, based on your goodness, Lord, we can have confidence in your goodness and in your faithfulness. That what you've done on the cross and coming out of the empty tomb and accepting your gift of salvation, that we are in fact saved. Father, I thank you again for today, and I pray that you would bless each person that is represented here today, and for all of those on our prayer list, I ask that you would be with them and everyone who was mentioned. And I thank you, Lord, provide blessings to each one here and all who would like to be. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.